I've been involved with soccer for pretty much my whole life. Some of my earliest memories growing up were either me kicking a ball or watching someone kick a ball on TV. It didn't matter if it was at Bofo with the Chivas in the early 2000s, if I was watching Wayne Rooney at Man U, or if I was cheering on Tati, the ever-loyal Tati at Roma. By the way, shout out to Tati. One thing that just never seemed to happen, however, was me getting into the MLS. Until now. When it came to the MLS, I always feel like I heard the same things over and over and over again. It's a retirement league. It's not competitive. Nobody in the United States even cares about the MLS. I mean, like, you hear that all the time, and really I felt like there was no point in going to the games. More so, it was just like, why would I watch it on TV if it wasn't competitive? You know, when I can watch Liga MX, Premier League, Bundesliga, whatever. It, so for years i just kind of ignored it and outside of the big buzz from like a signing from the usual suspects in new york or la galaxy mainly at the time i really didn't hear much about it and so for the longest time i really didn't have any reason to change my opinion on the league until the last few years with 11 new franchises joining the mls and yes it is franchise all right it's just the way american sports and the mls are including Miami, Orlando, St. Louis, Nashville, and San Diego plan to join in 2025, an influx of legitimate world-class talent, including the likes of Messi, obviously, one of my personal favorite signings on FM24, Facundo Torres, and Thiago Almada. All of a sudden, I'm curious. I'm interested in the MLS. And what better place to start than my local side, Colorado Rapids. The Rapids were established October 17, 1995, where they were actually one of the original 10 teams with the league. They started playing their games at Mile High Stadium, where you would have been more likely to see NFL teams Denver Broncos and the baseball team the Denver Bears. Yeah, this is before the Rockies. Eventually, they moved to Empower Field in 2002 and finally Dick Sporting Good Park in 2007. Unfortunately, that inaugural season really seemed to set the tone for the organization. They've only lifted the League Cup one time in 2010, and they've been runner-up in the MLS Cup in 1999 and the US Open Cup in 1997. They've also seemed to struggle making any sort of impact on the continental scene, only making the round of 16 in the CONCACAF Champions one time in 2022. In the early 2000s, it seemed like they were finishing fourth every year. Mind you, from 2001 to 2008, that was out of a possible five places. And outside of a second place finish in 2016 and winning the conference in 2021, they've really struggled as of late, finishing fifth or worse every year since 2009. Supporters were sick of inconsistent finishes and a perceived lack of talent, and finally, in a year where they took dead last in 2023, Colorado knew they needed to change something and they needed to bring in fresh faces. So that's exactly what they did. With the signings of Jordi Maholovic and Zach Steffen from Man City, they were really excited to bring in some new talent alongside this budding homegrown talent that everyone seemed to be kind of excited about. New head coach and former U.S. international Chris Armas also took control of the team in the offseason, and there was an air of cautious hope around Dick Sporting Good Park for the first time in a few years, it seemed like. So, seemingly set up for a successful new season, one of the things I kept hearing about was how competitive everybody wanted to be in this thing called the Rocky Mountain Cup. Despite what I had been led to believe, there was actually a very vested and intense fan interest in the game, and nothing made this more apparent to me than learning about this specific cup. So, when the MLS announced that Salt Lake was going to be getting an expansion team in 2005, five fans from Colorado and five fans from Salt Lake got together to form what was called the Committee of Ten. The Committee of Ten had one job, to organize the Rocky Mountain Cup. The Rocky Mountain Cup is simply a competition played between Real Salt Lake 
and Colorado Rapids. It is a derby simply set up on proximity alone. And I understand. I understand. All right. To a UK fan, the idea of an eight hour drive being a proximity derby is absolutely insane. However, you have to understand the sheer size of the United States. All right. That's all I'm saying about it. The cup is played across four meetings throughout the season with a winner of the game getting three points, so on and so forth, just like a normal league match. Colorado won the inaugural edition of the Rocky Mountain Cup, winning three out of four meetings with a comfortable nine points. However, it would be the 2006 edition of the cup, the second year of its existence, that really seemed to set the cup up for what it would turn into and make it a very proper derby indeed. Prior to the 2006 season, Colorado and Real Salt Lake actually had a player swap. Colorado was sending forward Jeff Cunningham to Salt Lake in exchange for midfielder Clint Mathis. And while Colorado did go on to win the second edition of the Cup second straight year, it would be Real Salt Lake that seemed to draw first blood in this rivalry and set this derby off for real. August 10th saw the two sides playing in Colorado where a spirited performance from the newly acquired Jeff Cunningham saw him account for two goals and one assist, leading Real Salt Lake to a very comfortable 4-1 win over hated rivals Colorado. And it would be their final meeting that season, however, where Colorado finally got to fire back. September 2nd saw Colorado make the trip over to Real Salt Lake, and with fresh wounds from the previous month's meeting, they had something to prove, and they sure played like it. And what could only be described as a chippy game that saw several hard fouls and seven yellow cards, Colorado held on to get out a very, very tough 1-0 win and secure the second straight edition of the Rocky Mountain Cup and bring it back to Colorado. However, after the game, it would be their captain by stuffing his shirt down his shorts and making gestures to the crowd that would make Ronaldo blush. Even finding himself in a, let's say, friendly conversation with then Real Salt Lake head coach Dave Checklitz. This is hardly starting to look like the boring league I was told this would be. The more I researched this, the more I was realizing we may not have a hundred year history of some of these UK teams, but we're making our own. And the tone had been set for the rivalry moving forward with numerous instances across the years, including fan interactions, heartbreaking goals, stoppage time moments, and unfortunately for Rapids fans, they've come out on the losing side particularly more times than not, only winning three times since 2006, aka the first two editions of the Cup. Having already checked out the local MLB and NFL teams, the Rockies and the Broncos, let's ride. I had a level of expectation for a game day experience in Colorado. So I decided this was the year I was going to check out Dick's Sporting Good Park affectionately known as the dick so first things first i showed up early on purpose to just have a look around see what's around the stadium get a feel for the atmosphere and well spoiler alert it it wasn't impressive <laughs> unfortunately for the stadium it's kind of in the middle of nowhere located roughly 10 minutes outside of denver and commerce city area is what it's called but really what it is it's a big open field with a bunch of soccer pitches on it and just that's it and then there's the park and a parking lot at least the parking's free anyway so i did a quick lap around like i said didn't see much and then i quickly just settled into the tailgate um the tailgate is one thing i didn't really get any footage of for a very good reason just because it was my first time there the tailgate is put on by a group called centennial 38 we'll talk about them later they're a group of fan of supporters you you'll hear about them soon don't worry but i just didn't think they would appreciate having a camera shoved in their face by someone they've never seen before so after paying my entry fee of of a easy 12 dollars, i quickly got to enjoy three hours of all i could eat and drink and your boy got hydrated let's put it that way so after that was done you know made my way inside the stadium and well I was very surprised with what I saw when I got in. Drums, chants, TFOs, it, the, the game had it all. I was blown away, pleasantly surprised, and I was instantly invested. The first half had some moments here and there, you know, it was some cool oohs and ahs, but 
really was the second half where everything kind of just took off um starting in 47th minute where an own goal actually gave colorado the lead and we were winning we were winning a game look at us go unfortunately for us we held on to it until the 90th minute and then we gave up a penalty so nashville capitalized on the 90th minute handball to get a penalty kick equalize steal a point and break the hearts of an entire stadium now nashville is actually a pretty good team you know last year they finished a respectful seventh so i think the energy around the stadium for the most part was could we make it you know competitive and i from what i saw from what i remember i saw and from what i saw on highlights i think we almost deserve to win the game i, I truly do i think we look good but unfortunately it's not all good in colorado i can't do one of these videos and pretend that it's all sunshine and rainbows behind the scenes for the club so we're just gonna get into it and dig into the negatives let's just call it what it is one of the common complaints i heard about when i was getting ready to go to the game was actually the stadium itself being built in 2007 for 65 million dollars it was built during this whole mls 2.0 wave we'll do a video on that soon don't worry it was designed with the idea of having concerts being just as important as the games being played in there and it kind of shows the layout of the seat of the seats the lack of a proper tunnel and just Kind of the way everything's spread out and just organized doesn't really scream sports arena to me, if that kind of makes sense. It's just it's just a different feel. It, it, it feels like a weird cross between a concert venue and an actual sports arena, which is ironically what it is. And so if that's what they wanted, they nailed it. But nowadays, it just doesn't just doesn't really make sense. The second thing I hear about the most actually kind of ties in a lot with the stadium. And that's the owner. The owner is a man named Stan Kroenke. And for some of you, his name would actually be familiar. This article from the Pro Soccer Wire really kind of just drives home the fact or kind of drives home what people were kind of complaining about. So essentially, the fans were labeling the club, an, and this is coming from the article, an utter embarrassment, and the supporters were releasing a statement slamming KSC. KSC being Stan's group, Kronke Sports and Entertainment, that actually owns his sports empire, pretty much is what it is, including the Colorado Mammoth in professional lacrosse, the Colorado or the Denver Nuggets in the NBA, the Colorado Avalanche in the NHL. Oh, and there's also that one little club in England you might know Arsenal. Yeah, that Arsenal. And now that you kind of maybe have put two and two together, you'll know that this isn't is that exactly the first time this ownership group has come under fire. Um, the fans were actually very, very upset with uh, KSC and their very open support of the failed and universally hated Euro European Super League that was being tossed around a few years ago. Anyways, the statement calls out KSC for a number of things, chiefly... A perceived lack of support and lack of interest in the team overall from ownership now I really want to say that no it no point did anyone say someone should be fired let go demand for anybody to be sold nothing like that it was simply the Centennial 38 remember them were kind of just saying hey it doesn't look like you care about this and we need you to care about this because we care about this and for what it's worth, I truly, truly hope that ownership listens to the supporters' complaints because I think anybody will tell you that without the supporters, without the fans, without people in the seats, what good is having a team? So I've mentioned fans and supporters across this video and especially one group in particular. And I just wanted to make sure I dedicated one entire portion of this video to that group and 
There's someone I believe they're one of the most influential and important groups in the whole story of this of this club. Centennial 38. I'm going to tell you right now I would not be doing this video and I would never return to a game if it wasn't for the Centennial 38. Founded in 2013 after the merging of three other groups, the Bulldog Supporters Group, Pit Army, and Class 6, the new group known as Centennial 38 was referencing Colorado joining America the year of America's Centennial Anniversary and the 38th state in the Union. C38, as they're, as they're known, is the biggest supporter group for Colorado and man do they come out in force. With drums, flags, organizing TIFOs, uh, being in charge of presenting the player of the match trophy to players and staff after the game, they are very, very involved with the club as a whole. I also want to say that they also do really good things aside from just, you know, chanting and singing. Like I mentioned before, they put together that whole message calling out the ownership group on what they thought was a lack of interest. I want to say they don't try and copy European hooligans or like ultras and try and have that whole kind of mindset. Instead what it is, it's kind of a very wonderful mix of American fans and an influence from the world game. And it shows. And they make rabid games a definite worthwhile experience. They hold a surprising 1600 seats and the energy spreads quickly. They have three different sections across the grounds and it really, really helps kind of involve every corner as best as they can. My favorite, however, is always going to be the ever rowdy, standing section only, south end, section 117. And that is where you're going to find me, for all future Rapids games, chanting my little heart out. So, here we are. One month into the season, one win, two draws, one loss. Colorado sits in 7th, including winning their first round of the Rocky Mountain Cup this year. So, while some may not be impressed or, you know, kind of happy with the performances of individuals and the team as a whole, I think I can pretty confidently say that myself and majority of the fans watching have a cautious optimism moving forward for this side. <laughs> Overall, I have to say, I love the energy that the Centennial 38 brought. I thought it was fun. I thought they were extremely welcoming. I think I had a blast there. It was one of the most entertaining sporting events I've been to in Colorado. Maybe the free beer has something to do with it. Hey, who knows? I don't know. I'm not going to say that, but drink responsibly. All I'm going to say is I barely made it to halftime before I bought season tickets. That first game isn't going to be my last game. The next home match is against Houston. I'm going to be there. I'm excited to see what else the MLS has to offer. I'm excited to see what else Centennial 38 has to offer. Fingers crossed Colorado gets the attention from ownership that the players, and most importantly the fans, really deserve. And let's hope the results keep coming. Let's keep the people cheering. Go Rapids.